It sounds like a scary place to be a fawn. Yeah. <laughs> Bears it, crawling around like, in thickets. It's like the Coliseum, you know? It's, <laughs> you're going to die. It's just how, you, <laughs> how, how do you want to die? Oh, my gosh. <laughs> That's terrible. Uh, That's in terrible. these big closed canopy, non-diverse landscapes, what what does that do long-term to antler quality? Or does it not have as much of an effect because all the deer are dying, so there's not as many mouths to feed? Now, are you reading our research? Are you coming up with these leading questions? Or are you just thinking in your own brain? Hey, man, I've just interviewed a lot of guys. <laughs> <laughs> That's pretty good. Um, well, interestingly, along with these these harvest data, Georgia DNR has good, done a good job of getting biological data on deer. And, what they're, and young males are a good index toward population health. And young males were in higher weights than they were in previous decades. Their antler mass was greater based on the circumference of their antlers, more points. And so fewer mouths to feed, you're right, Andrew, um, leads to deer that are in better health. So now we have a mountain hunting experience where hunters can go and see no or few deer, but they might be able to harvest a nice buck. Yeah, that and that tracks because there's a place in Alabama. I'm not going to say the name mm. of it, but everybody knows where it is, uh, that my whole life has been like that. It's traditionally been the low deer density part of the state where you go to kill the big giant bucks. It's like you go up there, like where we hunt, you might see you know a couple bucks a year, like whatever, uh, growing up. If you go up there, you might see you might see one buck a year, but it'll be a really good one. That was kind of like what everyone said about it. And so it, it seems like that that kind of holds true you know, in different states that, that we've been to as well. And also some of the better deer hunters that we know, or I'm not going to say some of the better deer hunters we know, some of the deer hunters we know who kill the biggest deer the most consistently hunt in areas like that, that have a lower deer density and a, and a better age class. Um, because I, I wonder if, you know, it's so hard to hunt those areas because it's such a low deer density. Like, I, actually, I guess we're about to get into this. So the hunter effort part of it, maybe some of those deer are also getting to older age classes because it's like, how many times are you going to go and not see anything like over? You're going to go home. Your wife's like, what are you doing? <laughs> or climb that mountain or drop down yep, this valley, go on the other side. Yep. That's right. Access. Which by the way, um, in 2018, Georgia DNR removed the ability to kill antlerless deer on these properties because deer population, we were still studying the populations, but it was clear where things were headed. And so you're going to the mountains and you can't even shoot a doe to take home. That's when your wife's really looking and you know, saying, where, where were you again? <laughs> Let you me doing? see your, your track log. <laughs> yeah, but add me on find my friends. <laughs> <laughs> so, so let's talk about the hunter effort aspect of it. So uh, deer populations are declining. Uh, harvest numbers declining. What about hunter participation in these areas? Right. Yeah. And something else I didn't have on my list uh, of topics was hunter satisfaction. And so what we saw was that, that hunter participation went way down. I can't remember exactly. I believe it's 70% or something like that. And so you're, you're talking about an area where families across generations would have gone to set up deer camp, sometimes for an extended period of time. Think of all those interactions that you have with, you know, your granddad and your, your aunts, uncles, whatever it may be, that's gone away. And so you've got these more singleton hunters moving to these areas and, you know, going for an abbreviated hunt. And so we have less participation. Um, and we also polled those hunters about their satisfaction. And what we saw was is that they just want to see some deer. Actually, they'd love to harvest a buck. They'd love to harvest a deer. But they go to the mountains for a mountain experience. They're still going to have it because the areas are beautiful, but that their satisfaction could be vastly improved just by being able to see deer and possibly harvest a buck. Okay. And so there's just less people doing that now? or Yeah. So they tracked hunter numbers because these, again, are, are, are hunts where folks are checking in and hunter numbers declined almost in concert with deer harvest numbers. And some might say, well, is it because there are fewer hunters? Well, success rates are relatively similar. So deer per hunter, but the hunter numbers are less. Okay. I got you. Interesting. Yeah. That's a, that's, that doesn't sound great. <laughs> I mean, no, well, I mean, it's great if, by the way, you want to go up there and not have a lot of competition. Well, I was going to, <laughs> uh, one, one thing kind of in the back of my mind, I am thinking like there, there are people who are definitely listening to the show who are like, Okay, less hunters, butt quality's going up. Um, Sounds pretty appealing. Just got to get used to not seeing some deer. 
Yeah, that's right. That's right. And definitely. I look at our some of our other data, and we, you know, hopefully we'll talk about hunter movements, et cetera. But you looked at, at these vast areas where there's nobody hunting, essentially, and so you can get back into areas that some of these bucks haven't seen a human. Uh, we're, oh, we're, 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 we're about to. Uh, get, let's mm. just. I want to. I kind of want to get on that a little I, bit. I want to ask about one more habitat thing okay. before we, because we're about to go down the rabbit hole on that. Um, you mentioned that in some of these areas, the only cover available would be your mountain laurel and rhododendron thickets. Uh, I mean, what to, what level of habitat is that for deer? I mean, it provides cover, but is it doing anything else for them? Like, is that good habitat or is it not good habitat? Well, also, it's it's not providing good cover. Let me let me just debunk that a little bit because if you get into those stands, um, deer still eat it. Uh, in particular, mountain laurel. It's really low protein levels, so it's kind of like starvation food is what we term it as deer biologists. But it still has a browse line, and then the rhododendron along the creek courses. It's grown to such a, a degree. It's not like this little, you know, this, this stick thin rhododendron. We're talking about rhododendron the size of a man's thigh, and oh. it has. It, there's no understory because nothing else can grow underneath it, and there's no rhododendron leaves for at least a couple feet. And so, if you're a bear, you can crawl in there and you can have you know nice cover and all that stuff. But if you're a fawn in there, the bears are crawling through and coyotes are coming through and they don't have a lot of competition having to see through leaves, et cetera. And so they're, it's not great cover for deer. It's not great forage for deer. It provides some cover. It makes it a little difficult for hunters to get through it. But for predators, it's, it's, it's dynamite for them looking for fawns. It sounds like a scary place to be a fawn. Yeah. <laughs> Bears it, crawling around like, in thickets. It's like the Coliseum, you know? It's, <laughs> you're going to die. It's just how, you, <laughs> how, how do you want to die? Oh, my gosh. <laughs> That's terrible. That's terrible. So, so really, I mean, because we've been to some of these areas, and there's, like, complete absence of any cover. Like, besides the mountain, like the, I guess the mountain laurel is just really the only thing that they have. And there's not really an alternative. Unless you get some storms come through and get some storm damage. Like, that's that's the one thing. Like, you get in some of those areas, big thunderstorm. Like, I don't know if it, y'all have many tornadoes in that area. But it's like, you get a big snow. Like, I you probably don't deal with a lot of ice down here, even up there. But, right. like, you know, something to put, break some trees down to get more sunlight to the ground. is like, you find little pockets of it, and that's like it. Or like, blown down trees for the most yeah, part. Yeah, and, and so, like, you're kind of, like, in this tip and mound ecosystem where a big tree falls over and its root ball comes up. And normally that gap would be filled by regeneration, but still deer hammering those areas because there's just not a lot of forage. And so it will be a gap, but often it's just an empty gap. And so you need it on, on a large scale, a lot of trees coming down. I will say the Forest Service has used some more intensive fire, and growing season fire that tends to be a little bit more, have a better ability to punch through that canopy and kill some trees and get some sunlight to the forest floor. So where they're applying fire across broad areas, especially during the growing season, they can have some success with getting some growth. So before we move on to the GPS stuff and the hunter movements and everything, if there's someone listening to this who's fired up and you know, they don't like the way that the Forest Service is managing these properties. What are some things that they can do? Yeah, well, everything that's done by the Forest Service is transparent, I have to say. I know people think the government does everything in a black box somewhere, but they, and I just saw a request for public comment on habitat management on the Chattahoochee National Forest. And so there are public meetings. They put in for scoping documents are available online so people can see what the Forest Service is planning to do. And if hunters and other enthusiasts that have consumptive values, anglers, etc., they can comment on this. But guess who's commenting on it? Forest Watch and their contingent. And so we need to get out there and have that voice to say, hey, we, we want to see this timber harvest go through. Is there any nonprofit group on our side of things who's doing a decent job of that, whether it be National Deer Association, uh, um, uh, NWTF, uh, RGS, Quail Forever, it, is anybody doing a decent job with that? Oh, well, I've seen multiple times where NDA, National Deer Association, encourages their membership to speak out. They give good info information on the subject, and so it's digestible by us and a quick 
setting so we can understand where we stand on the issue and they let us know about public meetings. Also, backcountry hunters and anglers do a good job of keeping keeping their finger on, on the pulse of what Forest Service is doing.